Good evening to one and all. Today, we have gathered for Professor G.H. Arthur Commemorative Oration 2021 Global Veterinary Reproduction Webinar organized by Directorate of Clinics, Tanawas, Chennai. At the outset, first, I will call Professor K. Krishnakupar, sir, Professor and Head of Department of Veterinary Gynecology and Obstetrics, Madras Veterinary College, for proposing welcome address. Sir. Very good morning and good evening, sir. <clears throat> On this special occasion of Professor G. H. Arthur Commemorative Oration 2021 Global Veterinary Reproduction Webinar, I wish to welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor and Chief Patron, Dr. C. Balachandra. I also welcome our beloved Registrar and Patron of this webinar, Dr. P. Tenzing Nyanaraj. I extend my warm welcome. Who is instrumental in organizing this webinar? Dr. S. Balasubramanian, Director of Clinics, Convener and Chairman and Organizing Secretary of this webinar. In the present scenario, ultrasonography and canine reproduction are inseparable as it is needed not only for the routine procedures like pregnancy diagnosis and assessing the fetal viability but also in assessing the uterine pathological conditions like cystic endometrial hyperplasia, pyometra, medical termination of pregnancy, sub-involution of placental sites, etc. Manipulative delivery in case of bitches is a difficult process due to small birth passage through which hand cannot be passed. <clears throat> Hence, the present topic would enlighten us about manual handling of dystochia for pervaginal delivery of pups. In the present context, I am overjoyed to welcome Professor Gary C. W. England, a co-associate of Professor G. H. Arthur, to deliver a special lecture on reproductive ultrasound and manipulative delivery pervaginum in dogs. I also welcome to co-organizing secretary, Dr. G. Vijayakumar, Professor and Head, Veterinary University Peripheral Hospital, Madhavaram, all the faculty members, participants, including the undergraduate and postgraduate students and practicing veterinarians worldwide who are attending this webinar and urge them to make it a memorable one. Welcome to one and all. Thank you. I invite organizing secretary and director of clinics, Tanawas, Chennai, Professor S. Balasubramanam, sir for giving inaugural address. A very warm Good morning and good evening to all the participants and the speaker. <clears throat> uh, most respected uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Dr. C. Balachandran, Dr. Tenzing Yanaraj, the Registrar of uh, Tanavas, the co organizing secretaries, Dr. Krishna Kumar and Dr. Vijay Kumar, the other members of the committee, Dr. Rangasamy. Dr. Suresh Kumar, Dr. Bharati Dasan, Dr. Medai, and uh, Dr. Trinav Karsa and Dr. Vimal Rajkumar, and my dear uh, participants. <clears throat> now, I deem it a privilege to inaugurate this unique webinar. This is a Professor G. H. Arthur Commemorative Oration 2021 Global Veterinary Reproduction Webinar. Uh, I would like to just brief about this webinars which the Directorate of Clinics has been organizing for the past one year. Uh, 
the covid 19 the pandemic situation globally has taught people to switch over from classroom teaching to online classes it has advantage same time it does has the limitations this directorate has so far organized four uh, webinars and we were the first to introduce this webinar concept uh, way back in 2019 for students of all the four constituent colleges of Tanuas. Later, when this pandemic situation came up, and from that time onwards, so far we have organized 10 webinars, all global webinars, with all international speakers. And this is 11th in the series. And this is very unique. So I would like to just give a very brief note on Jeffrey Herbert Arthur, veterinary surgeon and academician, was born in March 6, 1916, and passed away March 11, 2007. Jeffrey Arthur uh, lived up to 91 years. And he was one of the most influential veterinary surgeons of the 20th century. He had a long teaching career in uh, different places in UK, Liverpool, London, Bristol, and uh, lastly in Saudi Arabia, where his work included attending pregnant animals, that is especially camels. Uh, he was a, a reader in uh, veterinary surgery at Royal Veterinary College RVC London from 1949 to 1951. Probably as a result of his work on trichomonious fetus infection in cattle at Liverpool, his area of interest changed to that of veterinary clinical reproduction and obstetrics in farm animals as well as horses and dogs. In the case of the later two species, he was supposed to be a true pioneer. Then later he became a reader in veterinary surgery and uh, obstetrics in the University of London in 1952 and was awarded the fellowship of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in 1957 for a study on testicular descent and uh, cryptorchidism in horse. And uh, the degree DVSC in 1957 by the University of Liverpool for his published work. And later, 1962, he took over for the second edition of the textbook, Veterinary Obstetrics, where he typically broadened the scope of the book to include all facets of reproduction. It is now the standard English language textbook for veterinary reproduction and has been translated into six languages. Jeffrey was a professor of veterinary obstetrics and diseases of reproduction at the University of London from 1965 to 1973. But after 24 years at the RVC, he was appointed to the chair in veterinary surgery in University of Bristol in the year 1974. There he continued his work in teaching, clinical and research in veterinary reproduction. He was also appointed the editor of the Journal of Small Animal Practice. Later, when he retired from uh, Bristol in the year 1979, he decided to take his skills and experience to help in the establishment of, of the first and the only veterinary school in Saudi Arabia as clinical professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Resources at the King Faisal University, where he remained until 1984. So this is the, the brief introduction and the uniqueness of this G.H. Uh, Arthur, Professor G.H. Arthur commemorative oration. And uh, the second uh, uniqueness is that we have the most right and apt person who has associated with Professor G.H. Arthur and later an editor of the book Veterinary Obstetrics and uh, Reproduction. And uh, and uh, when we when we go through the book, we are, I told yesterday to Professor Gary C. W. England that uh, we have uh, read the information 
but we have never seen the person. Maybe either in the photo or this is live. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity because people always say when they write their thesis, when they write an article, when they refer uh, uh, Dr. England. Uh, now the students uh, have an opportunity uh, throughout India, not only India, all over the world, because I, I guess we have over close to 800 uh, participants live uh, watching this uh, webinar. So this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and uh, I have to uh, thank uh, Professor England for accepting our invitation to deliver this uh, Professor G.H. Arthur commemorative oration today. Thank you very much. Now I invite Professor G. Vijay Kumar, co-organizing secretary, and Professor Ed, Veterinary University Peripheral Hospital, Tanuvas, Chennai, for introduction of the speaker, Professor Gary C. W. England. Uh, thank you, Dr. Medai. At the outset, I profusely thank Professor England for having accepted for this presentation. Thank you very much, sir. And I have a great pleasure in introducing the today's speaker, Dr. Professor Gary England, is the Foundation Dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine and Science and is a Professor of Comparative Veterinary Reproduction, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Science, University of Nottingham. Sir has graduated from Royal Veterinary College, University of London. He obtained his PhD in 1990. He is a fellow of Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and is recognized as a specialist in veterinary reproduction by the Royal College and the European College of Animal Reproduction. He is a diplomat of American College of Theologianologists and a visiting professor at the Royal Veterinary College, University of London. Professor England was instrumental in developing a new veterinary curriculum at the University of Nottingham and he is an advocate of innovation in teaching, learning, and assessment. Professor England's research interests are reproductive biology, particularly the interaction between sperm and the female reproductive tract, and the effect of environmental chemicals on fertility. Canine behavior, predominantly epidemiological modeling of behavioral tests, and colic in horses, is a part of Nottingham Equine Colic Project which generates new evidence and recommendations on the recognition and assessment of colic, and in collaboration with the British Horse Society, produces React Now to Beat Colic. Professor England uses psychosocial research methods to study evidence behind clinical decision making. He established the Center for Evidence Based Veterinary Medicine at the University of Nottingham with the Professor Malcolm and Professor Sir Peter Rubin. Gary England is an academic clinician who undertakes clinical work and research in the field of reproductive biology in dogs and horses. Dr. Gary's research group was the first to perform in vitro fertilization in dogs. And his notable work on horses include follicular dynamics, ovulation, sperm transport within the reproductive tract. I'm handing over the mic to Professor Gary England, and we are very eager to listen to your lecture, sir. Thank you very Thank much. Very, much. Very, very, very kind of you. Um, and I'm absolutely, absolutely delighted to uh, be here today. Um, I'm very honoured to have been uh, asked to give this uh, presentation. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Hopefully that will work. So hopefully you can uh, you can see my screen. Yeah, that's good. And um, I, I, I wish to say, um, you know, very many thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, you know, it's a it is a it's a great honour to um, even have been thought of um, to to uh, to give this presentation. And also, you know, very pleasing to to hear um, the highlights and careers um, that you've uh, you've you described um, of Professor Arthur and you know a huge contribution that he's made 
um, to our, our subject. And uh, you know, clearly, I'm very much in in awe of him as a as a person, as a as a clinician, and as a researcher. And you know, it's very much my honour to have been able to continue a, continue the the work in uh, publishing uh, his book, the book. Um, and uh, I, you know to to keep that alive and to develop it actually to you know to expand the the subject areas and things. And also, I'd like to say you know thank you very much for the very kind words that you've uh, that you've said about uh, me th um, this evening. It's uh, it's very kind to for you to have uh, um, said those words. Um, so what I'm going to uh, do is uh, give, give you a tour of um, some aspects of the reproductive tract is uh, examined by ultrasound uh, in dogs uh, and, and touch a little bit around manipulative delivery and actually why that's uh, quite difficult and actually why ultrasound plays such a huge part in our investigation of uh, female dogs um, at the time of, um, of parturition. Um, and it's a combination, really, of um, work that um, I do clinically. So I'm I'm still active in the clinic. So it's it's a combination of that, um, illustrating to you some of the things that are clinically important and common, um, building that into the basic biology and physiology, because the biology and physiology of the dog is quite uh, different to um, to many other species. And then kind of at the interface of those things is the things that you know stimulates my research interest which in, in most cases actually of course fits very much into the into the clinical situations that we see the scenarios that we see um, and why they're important so i'm going to uh, talk first of all um, about the, the uh, about the female about the bitch and of course, you'll all be very familiar with the reproductive anatomy of the of the dog. So we've got the the reproductive tract here on the on the left hand side, um, a nice radiograph uh, here in the centre where there's a positive contrast study. So you can see that we've got contrast material um, present here in the vagina. This is the region of the cervix, and then you can see some contrast filling um, across the left and the right uterine horns just here. So kind of a typical, uh, perhaps older way of in investigating the tract. Um, one of the things that we that we did uh, many years ago uh, when I was at the Royal Veterinary College was to just to try to identify the reproductive tract with ultrasound. And I found it very difficult to start with, particularly to identify the ovaries. And uh, one of the um, early papers that we published what we did is we um, put some metallic markers onto the ovarian bursa. So on this radiograph, you can see I've put uh, two little markers attached to the ovarian bursa on this ovary and one on this ovary. And that was really helpful, um, probably because we were using poorer quality ultrasound machines, but it was really helpful to enable us to identify where the ovary was and uh, to give us some confidence about being able to find the ovary. And of course, what we realize is that you know the ovary is quite difficult to image. Um, so when we look on this image here, you can see the outline of the ovary. The color flow obviously is highlighting flow around it. Uh, but in a dog that's not cycling, because there's no follicular structures containing fluid, it's very difficult to, to image the ovary. The ovary is very close to the abdominal wall, so sometimes it's in the in the near field noise um, of the ultrasound trans, uh, transducer. But of course, it's the fact that the there's a very well uh, demarcated ovarian bursa in the dog, which often contains fat, uh, that causes us part of the problem of being able to push sound through that and to be able to identify the, uh, the ovary. Most of the studies we do is either in standing dogs or recumbent dogs and imaging from the, from the flank position like you can see, see here. So you can identify the ovary. Um, one of the things I learned pretty quickly is that um, just because you find things near the ovary or where you expect them, uh, where the ovary to be, doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're anything that's significant. Um, and here's a really nice example of both the ultrasound appearance and also the, the live appearance of a very typical cystic structure sitting on the ovarian bursa. So this is a, a, a non-hormonally active cyst, which I'm sure many of you will have seen when uh, you've been associated with spays or caesarean operations. And of course, these things are very common and it's very easy to uh, mistake them and actually think that they have some clinical significance. So just because we find things next to the ovary doesn't necessarily mean that they have any significance for, uh, for, for, for fertility or even for cyclicity. We just need to recognise that they will be there.
in our very early studies, so we were using these metallic markers. So you on the on the lower panel here, you can just see the top of this marker and this little uh, white area, this shadow. Well, it's a reverberation artifact created by the marker, enabled us to identify where the ovary was. And again, you can see the shadow here clasped uh, underneath the marker. And we were able to track follicle growth, so some nice follicles here. And then at the time of um, luteinization of the follicle wall and then ovulation and development of the, of the CL, so we were able to track dogs through and in this uh, uh, in this ultrasound image again you can see in this moving image you can see the uh, thick wall appearance of uh, follicular structures as they approach ovulation associated with this luteinization of the follicle wall um, but what we did uh, discover um, uh, really obviously i guess is that the corpus luteum the, the luteal structure has a very thick wall too and has a central fluid filled cavity certainly up to 20 days or so after ovulation and so actually being able to determine the timing of ovulation is really quite tricky so here we've got some small pre-ovulatory follicles here we've got some um, early luteal structures and here we've got an outline of an ovary with one follicle but also with one CL present one corpus luteum present as well so determining the, uh, the determining the time of ovulation is actually quite tricky requires multiple examinations and what you're looking for in most cases is a temporary loss of the fluid filled component of the follicle presumably is associated with a, a bleeding into the follicular cavity which then clears and leaves us with a, a much more typical structure, a luteal structure, which is a thick wall, but again with a, with a, a really obvious fluid filled cavity that you can see on this histological um, specimen below, sorry, this uh, um, anatomical specimen below. But bearing that in mind, what we were then able to do was to try to look at follicular dynamics in dogs. And uh, of course, we've done a lot of that type of work in horses where you're looking at one follicle and it's relatively easy to identify the same follicle each subsequent day and, and track the, the growth of the follicle. Of course, in the dog, when you've got multiple follicles on each ovary and they're all quite small, it's quite difficult to do that. Um, so tracking an individual follicle, it becomes really impossible. So what we did is just to uh, classify follicles as being small or large, uh, simply based upon their size. And this graph here shows quite nicely the changes in follicle uh, numbers that you can see as the dog comes into oestrus and then ovulates. So these are the number of corpus lutea, that, so number of corpus luteum increasing after ovulation. These are the number of large follicles, obviously increasing and decreasing just before and after ovulation. And then this is the number of small follicles. So actually you see in late anestrus of dogs, small numbers, and then an increasing number on each ovary of these small follicles. And of course, you know, as the as anestrus phase moves into the early proestrus phase, um, those follicles are getting larger, producing the hormone estrogen, and that's causing the, um, the pheromone production and the changes in behavior of the females. So we've used this kind of um, system, simple classification system, to look at normal follicle dynamics and even to look at follicle dynamics in cycles where we have um, artificially controlled the cycles. Uh, so on this graph here, this shows uh, the same uh, type of thing, the, the number of large and small follicles and the number of CLs comparing between spontaneous cycles and cycles induced using the drug cabergolin. Um, and what you can see actually with the cabergolin treatment is that the number of uh, follicles, both small, so you can see the treated and the control small follicle numbers here, they follow a very similar uh, profile. And when we look at the number of large follicles, again, they're following the very same kind of profile and also the number of CLs, very, very similar um, so, um, profiles. Obviously, this um, this graph is very much expanded in the number of days compared to the last one, which was showing 100 days or so before um, ovulation. This is all around the, the period of pro-estrus and estrus. Um, so this has been helpful to us, in, fa in fact, in kind of um, uh, improving methods for estrus induction in dogs. You know, when we use other regimes like equine chorionic gonadotrophin and human chorionic gonadotrophin, we find completely different types of follicle dynamics um, using the ultrasound tracking. So, and of course, they are very often associated with poorer fertility, which, um, which makes absolute sense.
Uh, of course, we can use ultrasound not only to identify um, the ovary that's normal, but we can also use it to identify the ovary that's abnormal. And of course, you know, one of the abnormalities we see in entire old females is ovarian tumor, ovarian neoplasia. And you can see very nicely on this um, image on the uh, on the right hand side um, some structures which look like normal um, ovary, but then this kind of multi cystic appearance, and then in a, in certain areas a very solid type of appearance of the tumor. So a very common type of um, appearance with them, which is very heterogeneous. So very often some remnants of normal tissue and then this very often cavitated or honeycomb like lesion that you'll see very typical actually in, in granulosa cell tumors of of many different types of species. Um, whilst um, follicular cystic structures themselves in dogs aren't very common, they do occur sometimes and uh, the type of presentation of those, of course, is the dog that has uh, prolonged oestrus or prolonged proestrus or oestrus. So the dog gets stuck in the oestrus phase of the cycle. And if you ultrasound those animals, of course, then you may be able to identify um, these larger structures. So most follicles in a, uh, in a dog, a cycling dog, will ovulate at around um, nine millimeters or so. Um, so they, the cystic structures are usually larger than that, can certainly be up to 12 or 14 millimeters in diameter, and they're static in their appearance, of course. Um, so they, we can use ultrasound, of course, to, to uh, determine this type of, uh, of pathology and, of course, to monitor um, the response to treatment. So in these cases, we would normally give something like HCG on um, successive days to try to see if we can force these follicles to ovulate. Now, if you move on to the uterus, so thinking first of all, first of all about looking at the normal uterus, I'll start with the picture in the middle. So this image is a transverse image. Um, the transducers on the ventral abdomen. So this is ventral here. This is the outline of the bladder, of course. So we've got the lateral wall of the bladder, the dorsal wall of the bladder here and the lateral wall on the other side. This echogenic structure here is the colon. So it's casting an acoustic shadow underneath. And here in the transverse plane is a cross-sectional view through the uterus. So it's the body of the uterus that we can see. And if you look over on the uh, on the moving image, as we move further forwards, you can actually see the uterine body separates out and you can just start to see the two uterine horns separating away from each other as we scan more cranially across into the uh, into the abdomen. If we turn the ultrasound transducer around through 90 degrees, so that's this image over here. Again, we can see the urinary bladder. So this is over here is uh, cranial and this is caudal. So this is where the bladder neck is narrowing down. So we're, we'd be entering the urethra over here. This uh, with, the th with the smaller arrows is the, the longitudinal section through the body of the uterus. And this slightly dilated area is the region where you can identify the cervix. Of course, the, the uterus doesn't always sit exactly in the midline, so it's not always situated um, on the dorsal aspect of the bladder. So in this case, of course, you know it, it nearly is, but sometimes you'll find the uterus situated over here. So it's adjacent to the bladder rather than specifically dorsal to the bladder. Uh, the uterus will change in size. So particularly when the dog is in oestrus, you find that the uterus is larger in diameter than it is when the dog is in diestrus and also when the dog's in oestrus the tract tends to be edematous and so very often you'll identify um, that the, the uh, reproductive tract is more is darker in appearance is more anechoic in, in appearance and one of the things that we were doing uh, with ultrasound uh, um, it was mentioned in the introduction our interest in um, looking at sperm transport one of the things we uh, we, we were interested in is looking at uterine contractions with ultrasound um, and this graph here shows uh, the changes in the in the number of contractions as the dog moves through different phases of proestrus and oestrus. Uh, so the solid arrow here is the day of ovulation, and um, this is the 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 profile of oestrogen, plasma oestrogens, which obviously decline just before ovulation. And this is the rise of progesterone. So you're remembering dogs would get pre-ovulatory luteinization, so progesterone concentrations increasing before and then continuing after ovulation. And what I've indicated on this schematic is 
um, the fertilization period, the time when eggs are available to be fertilized. So I'm sure you remember that when eggs are released in the dog, um, they're not immediately fertilizable. It takes about two days before the oocytes can be uh, can be fertilized. And then the oocyte hangs around for several more days. So this, this little block of time is the fertilization period. And what I've drawn on this graph is the the number of contractions um, in the uterus, uh, which is a very slow number. So if you look here, it's a, just over five. So an average of six contractions in 20 minutes. So a small number of contractions. And these are basal contractions. These are the number of contractions that just occur uh, on a continual basis. So they're relatively flat in number, and then they drop quite dramatically um, at the end of the fertilization period. Um, and that, of course, is associated with higher concentrations of progesterone. So in many species, of course, progesterone decreases the number of uterine contractions. That seems to be what we see here in the dog. And then in red, um, the other thing we did in, in, a, in a group of dogs was to measure the number of contractions associated at the time of mating. So we were able to use the ultrasound exam and uh, monitor contractions of the uterus during the mating process. And what's really interesting, of course, is that there's this very, very dramatic increase in the number of contractions as we get towards the fertilization period. And of course, that's probably just simply associated with a, a sensible mechanism for moving sperm around the uterus to ensure that they can be deposited close to the uterine tubule junction um, to move into the uh, sperm reservoir that we that we find there. Now, when we were doing our ultrasound exams looking at the uterus, one of the other features that uh, became really obvious is that it was actually quite easy to detect the uterine artery and vein. Um, and on this cross-sectional image here, so you can see the circular appearance of the uterine body. Here's the colon again, look, um, just more situated more dorsally. And then with a color flow ultrasound, you can see artery and vein positioned laterally. And of course, you know, there'll be another artery and vein positioned over here. And on this longitudinal scan, so the body of the uterus is just out of shot here. But again, of course, you can see the arterial supply and then the branches moving in towards the uterus. So there's one just coming into view here and there's another one just out of shot down here. Uh, down here. So we were able to identify um, the blood supply to the, to the uterus in a, a number of different regions. Um, and when we started to look at uh, the flow of um, blood in those um, arteries, uh, we were interested to look at the profile, the different types of patterns of flow. And this is a, um, a, a very typical example. So here we've got, uh, so this is obviously is time uh, along here. And then this axis is uh, velocity, um, so speed of blood flow. And what you can see is at the systolic contraction. So here's an increase in the speed of flow. So this is systole and then flow decreases. But then we get a continuation of flow throughout the entirety of diastole. So we've got the, the, the cardiac cycle pushing blood, but then blood flow continuing uh, in those vessels throughout the period of, of diastole. And um, I've, at the moment, I've just called this type C, and you'll, you'll, I'll come back onto that in a, in a moment. So it's just to illustrate to you that it's very typical pattern of a, a peak and then a continuation of flow throughout um, diastole. Now, one of the things I'm also going to mention uh, in this uh, part of the talk is measurement of uh, resistance index. So resistance index is um, basically a, um, a measure of um, how much flow is allowed downstream from where we're measuring the vessel. So if we have um, high systolic flow here um, and then very, very little flow in diastole, so the heart is the pumping is pushing flow through that vessel and then there's very little flow later on downstream what that's tending to indicate is that when there's no pressure there's little flow so probably there's high resistance in the vascular bed so we were interested in the resistance index to see whether or not there were changes in that measurement so are there things going on that may be associated with uterine pathology so measuring at the vessel but essentially that's an indicator of what's happening further downstream from that how easy is it for blood to flow through the through the tissues 
So what we did in some of our um, uh, dogs was simply to look at some um, arterial flow and just we were interested in did it change around the time of mating? And in this study here, uh, we've looked at um, this is systolic flow, um, just plotted the systolic flow, the peak systolic flow um, following on from um, in fact, this, ca this case was um, an insemination rather than a mating, but uh, time following on from uh, putting the semen into the uterus. Mm -hmm. And you can see there is a response. So you put semen into the uterus and systolic flow increases, diastolic flow increases. When you do the calculation to uh, looking at these two things, you can see that in fact, the increase of diastolic flow is greater. And so in, in actual fact, what's happening is we've got a, a vasodilation. Resistance index is decreasing and there's a vasodilation. So simply depositing sperm into the uterus of the dog is resulting in a vasodilatory response. So something is a, some triggering uh, of a physical response um, in the uh, in the blood vasculature. So which we thought was which was thought was very interesting, and I'll and I'll come back onto that um, uh, uh, when I talk about some cases of pathology. Now the other thing we were interested in doing, it kind of monitoring the physiology, was to look at the time of mating. What happens to sperm deposition? Uh, and on this picture here, here's the um, outline of the uterus, and this is, uh, sorry, here's the outline of the bladder, and this is the uterus again just positioned dorsally, and you can see that immediately after mating we've got fluid present within the uterus, of course we have, that's uh, effectively where sperm are deposited, but if you monitor over time, very quickly the depth of the fluid decreases. So what we think is happening, and here a very small amount of fluid, what we think is happening, of course, is these uterine contractions are doing two things. They're pushing sperm around the female tract, but they're also part of the mechanism for eliminating sperm from the reproductive tract. And it's not just sperm, of course, it will be bacteria and uh, other cellular debris and um, uh, commensal bacteria from the uh, from the bitch's vagina or the dog's penis. So, you know, we've got really contamination of the uterus at the time of mating, and the job of the uterus is to try to remove that contamination and return the uterus back to a normal situation. So we were able to, to document that. Now, in terms of pathology, of course, when you start looking at, um, uh, at a large number of dogs, uh, you start to pick up cases of pathology. So in this case here, this is a cross-sectional view. So again, this is the bladder. The colon is positioned just here. And this is a cross-sectional view through the uterus. And what you can see really nicely is this single endometrial cyst. And then on this longitudinal scan, you can see that this dog has got multiple cysts that are scattered along the length of this segment of her uterus. So this is a really good example of a dog with cystic endometrial hyperplasia. And of course, in many cases, when we see cystic endometrial hyperplasia, we often see it as a, a late stage disease where there is also pus in the uterus. And what we're really identifying is a pyometra. These dogs, of course, are very early on in the stage of the disease. These are dogs that are clinically well. They don't have a fluid filled uterus, but they do have well defined multiple cystic structures in the uterus. So they're certainly on the time frame or the time course for, you know, some, uh, in the future developing a pyometra. And in our studies, what we did is we uh, looked at a, a population of dogs. They're, the dogs were of different ages. And we just looking at this table here, what we found is effectively that the incidence of cystic endometrial hyperplasia, endometrial cysts, increased as the dogs uh, got older. So you can see dogs that were six years of age, you know, 33 percent of them uh, had cystic endometrial hyperplasia. I only had in my study a small number of very old dogs. So obviously these are all clinical normal otherwise um, but the numbers you can see are increasing so we definitely have a trend of seeing uh, cystic endometrial hyperplasia in these uh, in these dogs as they get old so one of the things we then tried to do is to say well okay so does that does that disease actually have any impact um, and you can see on this graph what I've done is I've plotted the emptying of the uterus so this is just a simple measure of the depth of fluid in the uterus after mating and this graph line here is the decrease in the depth of the fluid over time after mating. So you can see very, very quickly after mating, there's very little fluid. So this is one millimeter of fluid left 
you know, after six hours post mating and no fluid at all 24 hours later. But what was really interesting was in these dogs with cystic endometrial hyperplasia, there was a delay in the elimination from, of fluid from the uterus. So presumably the cystic structures were trapping fluid or there was something else going on, perhaps impa impairing uterine contractility. So maybe there were uh, lower numbers of contractions in the uterus. Um, so what we found, of course, is that when we started to look at dogs with ha that had uh, a, 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 um, a delay of uh, elimination from of fluid from their uterus, what we found is that it was associated with the with the with the outcome of pregnancy. So if fluid um, was retained within the uterus for a longer period of time after breeding, um, then the chances of those dogs getting pregnant, or perhaps I should say staying pregnant, increased. Um, and I guess, of course, that makes sense. If, you, if you've got um, contamination of your uterus at the time of breeding, so sperm and bacteria enter the uterus, if that contamination is eliminated very quickly, then of course, that means the uterus can return back to its normal state very quickly. And when the fertilized embryos enter the uterus, um, those embryos will be able to uh, survive. Whereas, of course, if fluid is maintained in the uterus and bacteria is maintained in the uterus, that environment is likely to be hostile um, and so will have an impact on the, uh, on the future pregnancy. So it was interesting that this, these dogs, which had cystic endometrial hyperplasia, had delay in fluid elimination and then also had an outcome on their pregnancy. And what we then also did was to start to look at the, the blood flow characteristics in these dogs. And um, the categorization that I used before, remember I used the terminology type C. So this categorization actually comes from um, human um, uh, uterine artery blood flow patterns. And this is a very typical, the ca category C, a typical normal flow. So the systolic contraction and then a continuous flow throughout diastole. And what we found in our dogs which had cystic endometrial hyperplasia that were not pregnant was in fact that they didn't always have a normal pattern. A number of them had an absence of flow in early diastole. So here we've got a systolic contraction and then no flow in early diastole, later flow in diastole and then the next systolic contraction. Some dogs had absence of late diastolic flow and some dogs had absence of early and late diastolic flow. So just remember what this is doing. We've got a systolic contraction when we're measuring the velocity of blood flow. If downstream you've got some resistance to blood flow, then there will be limited flow during diastole because of course you've not got the continuation of, the, uh, of pressure pushing blood um, through. So what this seems to indicate is that in these dogs with endometrial disease, there is inhibited blood flow in diastole, and that was uh, clearly present in the dogs with endometrial hyperplasia uh, that were not pregnant. There were a few other observations as well, but we, the, in terms of the ultrasound appearance, they were the things that we thought was that were really interesting. Now, of course, where do these dogs fit in? Well, they fit in as in the story of a pyometra right at the very beginning. So these are these are issues associated with breeding and fertility. So, you know, the dog is getting a contaminated uterus, which is, which is unable to deal with. So here's a really nice example again of that. So the arrows are de um, delineating the outline of the uterus and you can see these dark, almost anechoic cystic structures sitting there. So a very typical cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Of course, what happens in terms of the pathogenesis of the disease is that this progresses and you know perhaps a year later or you know maybe slightly more than that the wall of the uterus increases in thickness and these dogs will often develop fluid accumulation persistently within the uterus or certainly long into the luteal phase often that's called mucometra and then of course ultimately these dogs get a significantly deeper volume of fluid in the uterus and that may go on ultimately to a typical full-blown pyometra so i think the story of pyometra is you know very much based around ceh um, and, and what we see often clinically of course you know is the dog with a full-blown you know, pyometra that's sick but early on, this disease can obviously have some significance uh, for, uh, for fertility.
Now, one of the things we were uh, really interested in doing was to uh, to say, well, actually, can this also help us clinically in any other way? Is, can ultrasound help us in, an, in any other way? And um, what we've also um, uh, found is that um, if you look at the wall of the uterus um, in dogs that have a clinical pyometra, sometimes there is variability. So sometimes the wall is actually relatively normal. So in fact, this was a young dog that had a pyometra and you can see the wall of the uterus is um, not particularly thickened and there's no obvious cystic structures present within it. Look at this bottom image here. So we've got, here's the fluid in the uterus and you can see the thickness of the wall of the uterus. And you can also see we've got these little cystic structures present within it. And of course, the dog in the middle, again, a thickened endometrium here, a loop of um, a uterus with pus in it and another loop here and another loop here and obviously another one here. But what's interesting about these cases is if you track their response to medical treatment, these dogs actually um, uh, respond quite well and actually seem to have quite good fertility uh, if you can manage the, the condition medically. Whereas these dogs don't, um, they may respond well in terms of elimination of the fluid, but actually what you often find is that um, uh, you, uh, you have poor subsequent fertility. And of course, that's not really surprising because there's a very significant underpinning cystic endometrial hyperplasia. And we've already just discussed why that may have a, an impact on for fertility. So I think it does help us a little bit in terms of thinking about um, the, uh, the planning of um, uh, medical treatment of pyometra in dogs. You know, I'm not recommending it at all as a routine, but certainly some breeders may be asking that question. And of course, if there is clearly underpinning uterine disease, it's, it's uh, you know, prog pro the prognosis for fertility is likely to be uh, right, likely to be poor. Uh, we've also, of course, seen other types of disease of, uh, of the uh, uterus. So here's a, a nice example of a, a relatively indistinct uterine tumour. So this dog presented with a, a, a bloody vulval discharge, so a red coloured vulval discharge. Here's a dog that had a caesarean and then had um, a granuloma develop at the site of the caesarean. So there was presumably some uh, infection in, introduced at the uh, at the incision through the wall of the uterus. So, you know, uh, ultrasound is quite useful for looking at the uterus in addition to cystic um, endometrial hyperplasia. But of course, the big time we use ultrasound in looking at the uterus is for the diagnosis of pregnancy. And um, one of the things I've done already is to, uh, to mention to you the fertilization period. So the fertilization period, as I've drawn it on this uh, schematic here, starts about two days after ovulation. So it takes two days before the eggs become fertilizable. And then the eggs hang around in the reproductive tract, waiting for sperm to come along and fertilize them. And I've drawn on this schematic here, the end of the fertilization period, so the time when the eggs degenerate. Um, and so here we've, here we've got this block of time, really a block of time when eggs are available to be fertilized. But we also know in the dog um, from the work of DOAC, which was in the 1960s, um, that sperm can survive in the female tract for many, many days. Um, and some of the work that we've done, which I'm not talking about uh, today, has been looking at um, sperm binding to the epithelial surface of the uterine tube, which is part of the mechanism of, um, of that long survival of sperm. But what that does is it uh, it opens up the possibility for um, a pregnancy to occur for a dog that is mated many days before ovulation. So if a dog were mated over here, if she were mated, let's say, five days before ovulation, because sperm can survive relatively easily for seven days, the, this early mating can still result in a pregnancy because sperm can survive five days till ovulation and the two days afterwards. So they just fertilize the eggs when the eggs become available. So what I've drawn here is a, a block of time that I've called the fertile period. That's the time when the mating could result in a pregnancy. It's not necessarily the time when the eggs are available, but it's the time when sperm, if, it, if it's from a fertile male, can survive. Now, why is this interesting? Well, it, it's interesting, but it's also um, causes some slight confusion for us. So what we, um, what we know in dogs is that when we look at pregnancy length, when we measure the time from ovulation 
to the onset of parturition is actually relatively fixed. It's it's about 62, 63 or 64 days. So the kind of hormonal length of pregnancy, the endocrinological length of pregnancy is pretty tightly regulated, which is quite interesting. But of course, what I've just said is that, of course, we can have a dog that's mated many days before ovulation and we can have a dog that's mated many days after ovulation and she can still get pregnant. So if the interval from ovulation to parturition is 63 days, that's fine. But of course, if she can be mated many days before the ovulation occurs, so if we measure mating from the, sorry, if we measure pregnancy from the time of mating to when parturition starts, it can appear to be very long. Now, the, the interval from ovulation to parturition is exactly the same, just that the dog's mated early. And of course, that may be all the breeder knows. The breeder only may know when the dog was mated, not anything else about when she ovulated. And similarly, of course, if you mate the dog very late, if you mate her on the last day that there are any fertile eggs present in the tract, she can still get pregnant and she will then appear to have a pregnancy length that's short. So this little graph up here actually shows you the variation. So this is the number of dogs at the side, and these are the, the measured length of pregnancy from mating to the onset of parturition. So you can see some dogs have a pregnancy which appears to be very short, 55 days, and some have a pregnancy which appears to be very long, 72 days. So a big variation in terms of what pregnancy looks like, the apparent length of pregnancy. But the underpinning hormonal length of pregnancy is absolutely fixed at around 60, 63 days or so. Now, why is that important? Why am I talking about that when we're predominantly talking about ultrasound? Well, of course, what we know with ultrasound is that if we look at everything timed from ovulation, that it's very easy to be able to see the pregnancy probably as early as day 19 or 20, um, day 21, very, very easy. And many, many people will do their first ultrasound exam on day 28 because the conceptus is quite big at that time. An embryo will be present and it's, uh, it's easy to identify the embryo. But of course, if the owner doesn't know when the dog ovulated, if you count forwards 28 days and it happened to have been an early mating, your 28 day actually is only 19 days from ovulation. So the pregnancy might be so small you don't see it. So you might give a diagnosis of non-pregnancy just simply because you've examined too early. And of course, if you count forwards 28 days from what was a late mating, then it could be as long as 36 days from ovulation. So you think the pregnancy is abnormal because it's 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 overdeveloped for its age. So this big variation around ovulation time actually is important when we come to thinking about doing an ultrasound exam for, for pregnancy diagnosis. So in this very early phase is some nice examples of the of the early pregnancy like it is uh, often looks like it does in the horse. So it's a little spherical structure. So it's a little echogenic spot ventrally and dorsally. Uh, it becomes a little bit more elongate as you get to day 20 and day 21. So you can see the wall of the uterus here and here. This is the non-pregnant part of the uterus. And obviously this is the, uh, the pregnancy sitting in the middle. At the moment, there's no embryo. Of course, as we get a little bit further on, the embryo becomes obvious. And on this little image here, you can see the heartbeat uh, really um, identifying quite nicely. So we'd be about day 24 or so, something like that. So usually our 21 day scan enables us to identify the embryo uh, as we move further on through the pregnancy we, we can identify the individual membrane so this is the uh, collapsing yolk sac here's the outline of the placenta so the marginal hematoma is just here and then this is the main body of the placenta marginal hematoma is here and of course on the edges of the uh, conceptus there's no true placenta. Uh, so this is the bit which is uh, just the thin walled structure. Here's another example of the the, uh, the uh, placenta that we can see. So obviously it wraps around the uterus like a like a, a little uh, a, a napkin ring, something like that. As we scan further into pregnancy, we can see many other structures. So really nicely, we can see the heart in this puppy's uh, chest. You can see the head uh, just as we scan through it again. So the head is here, neck is here, here's the thorax with the heart, you can see the front limb buds, the caudal limb buds, the hind limb buds, and also the beginning of the tail. 
So we can see many more things as we move through pregnancy. And obviously looking at fetal heart rate is something that's really useful and I'll pick up on a moment on in a moment. Now, one of the things that we'll um, we'll find interesting when we're when we're thinking about um, cases of dystocia, of course, is in particular trying to predict when parturition is going to occur. Now, we know it's 63 days from ovulation, but of course, if we don't know when the dog ovulated, then we don't know when to expect parturition. So measurement of the conceptus, uh, measurement of the embryo or fetus can be helpful. And this is some of our work showing the, ch um, the changes in size of the conceptus as pregnancy progresses. So it can be useful and there are tables that are available that enable you to uh, um, have a, a standard measurement according to the, um, the individual breed um, uh, of the dog. During, the, um, during pregnancy, thought this sorry that video doesn't want to run but during pregnancy you can see other structures of course so there will be movement of the fetus so they may be like hiccuping movements um, and very very often of course will be interested in being able to detect the heart and I'll mention in a moment looking at uh, fetal uh, heart rate which can be really helpful to us. So here are some of the kind of um, measurements that we've um, used in the past. So measuring head diameter, so the diameter across the, the head. So obviously the, the, uh, the rostral part of the skull is here. So the nose is here. This is the caudal part of the skull. And this is the, uh, the measurement of the biparietal diameter. And here we've got chest diameter. So we can see nicely active heart, the ribs casting an acoustic shadow. And obviously we'd be measuring chest diameter. So there's a variety of different measures that enable us to um, work out when parturition is being, uh, it, it should be expected, which can be useful uh, when we're thinking then about um, being able to um, expect problems at parturition. So some of the features um, that, that I've talked about, of course, are very breed specific. So head size and chest size will differ if you've got a large breed dog or a small breed dog. But there are some things which are relatively generic. So the time that you can first see the limbs or the, the time that the yolk sac collapses, the time that you can first see the yolk sac. I mean, there will be slight differences if it's, if it's very large or very small because of your, uh, your ultrasound's ability to, uh, to, to detect them. But they don't vary according to breed. You know, the time that you can first detect the development of the eye, for example, is the same across the, across the individual breeds. So these, these things can be quite helpful if it's a breed where we don't have standard measurements available. When can we first see structures? When can we, on this little image here, when can we first see the bladder as, a, as an anechoic structure or the stomach as an anechoic structure? So bladder and stomach here. Um, so they, they can be helpful in terms of, uh, of aging. Now, of course, not everything always works well with the pregnancy. So sometimes, in fact, we do see um, pregnancy loss. And in fact, one of the things that's relatively common in dogs is to identify the resorption of one or two of the conceptuses, but with the pregnancy otherwise continuing. So on the you know, moving image at the top, you can see there's a resorption site. Um, there, there are two resorption sites and there was also a normal pregnancy. So here we've got anechoic flu uh, fluid with particles present within it. Here we don't see so much fluid in, in the second resorption site and uh, there's a normal pregnancy just here that you can see as well. So ultrasound is quite useful for, uh, for detecting pregnancy, also for detecting abnormalities um, of pregnancy, particularly things like resorption. And we do, as I said, see resorption of one of the conceptuses or two of the conceptuses in up to 10% of dogs. And in most cases, I think they're associated with abnormalities of the, of the pregnancy. So the, the um, pregnancies which are slow to develop, so for example, if you see them developing late for their age, they're the ones that are much more likely to go on and resorb. So I think it's um, probably a simple mechanism of, uh, of getting rid of the, the conceptus that, um, that is abnormal. So the things you'll see, like on the last slide, you know, the fluid develops particles present within it. Fluid may accumulate outside of the conceptus. So here's the conceptus and we've got fluid outside of the conceptus. The heartbeat stops, the embryo becomes blurred and then the embryo will break up. And like in the last two slides, uh, we'll have a, a, you know, a, a loss of the, uh, of the embryo altogether.
So in this case, we've got um, an embryo with no heartbeat, and we've also got a reduced blood supply present. So here's the uh, um, the yolk sac. This is the uh, um, um, the allantois. The embryo is situated just here, and you can see that there's no uh, no blood flow, no heartbeat in the in the embryo. Now I've mentioned. Uh, fetal heart rate a, a number of times and the reason that I've mentioned fetal heart rate is actually because it's a very useful assessment of um, the status of the um, of the fetus. So normal fetal heart rate is more than four times the maternal heart rate um, and so if we um, have stress to the fetus or certainly chronic stress to the fetus really I guess what we mean is we've got um, hypoxia then the common response of the fetus is to reduce its heart rate. So a reduction in heart rate. So you can see on this top image here, a very, very sluggish um, heartbeat in this puppy. And similarly on this one here, a very, very sluggish heartbeat. And in this bottom one, there's no heartbeat at all. And to me, these things are really helpful because they fit in very much to the question about manipulative uh, de de uh, delivery. Whilst we uh, will be focusing on the things that we can do for manipulative uh, delivery, um, what we should also be bearing in mind is um, what is the heart rate of the puppies that are um, in the uterus? So usually, of course, we've got one puppy that's stuck, but what's going on with the other puppies? And that actually may be a, a perhaps an even more important criteria because you'll see here once fetal heart rate drops, um, the outcome is going to be significantly impacted. So fetal heart rate of less than 130 beats a minute across the across the different breeds will give you very poor survival of the puppies. And certainly a heartbeat of less than 100 beats a minute means some intervention is needed. And, and of course, in many cases, if there's more than one puppy left in utero, that intervention probably needs to be a cesarean because you're not going to be able to deliver the puppy in a, in a suitable period of time. So when we think about cases of, uh, of dystocia in, uh, in dogs and, and in terms of our manipulation, when we're looking at the, the, the different types of, um, of dystocia, the key things, of course, relate to um, what, when, we, when we're um, having a, um, a dystocia presentation is um, what is going on with the puppies that are either in the birth canal or the puppies that are behind that puppy, the puppy that, um, that's stuck. So most cases we know it, uh, of dystocia are associated with primary uterine inertia. Um, and the other cases are relatively small in number. So uh, obstruction of the puppy because um, of its size or because of its, um, uh, because of its disposition. Now, whilst we know that we can correct uh, the puppy that's stuck, and we certainly can do that in terms of our, uh, um, our manipulation. The key question for me always is going to be what's going on with the other puppies, because if they have a slow heart rate and there's more than one of them, then I'm going to be wanting to think very much more about um, some other intervention in, in addition to can I, can I correct the, uh, the dystocia by manipulation. Now, of course, if the puppies that are in utero are um, are happy and healthy, so they have a high heart rate, then the key principles that we uh, we know about in the other species, which is creating room, so if possible, retropulsion, pushing the puppy back into as far back into the birth canal as possible, correcting the um, the position uh, um, and posture of the puppy, and then applying some traction to it. Now, of course, applying traction is something that can be tricky. So, you know, we'll often use uh, forceps or even a spoon if in a, in a situation where um, maybe you don't have all the obstetrical instruments, but a small teaspoon can be very often used to, to put over the top of the puppy's head and use as a grasping device. You can use your finger underneath the, the mandible and use that. Very difficult to, um, to pull on limbs, of course. Uh, pulling behind the head if you can get your fingers uh, um, around. Uh, so using two fingers you know, on either side of the neck can be very helpful. But the other things that can be helpful in these cases, of course, is just to think about what what additional resources have we got. And one of them is gravity. You know, so 
if you've got a bitch uh, on a um, on a table and it's a tilting table, then tilt the table so the bitch's head is downwards. That enables you to use gravity to help push the puppy back. And of course, if you've got a presentation like this one, where we've got the puppy's head deviated, with this dog in lateral recumbency, so if there's if this side is down, if we push this puppy in, it's more likely that this head will come into the midline than were we to have the dog the other way around, because we'd have to then push the puppy back and lift the head up. We've got gravity working against us. So in terms of these treatments, they, they, you know, they are limited in terms of our ability to manipulate, but they've always, to my mind, they've always got to be borne in mind with what else is, uh, what else is going on. Now, of course, if we've corrected a, um, an obstructive dystocia and all the other puppies are OK, we need to think about what's going on with uterine contractions. We know inertia is a common problem. So do we need to administer some additional oxytocin? Do we need to addition, uh, administer some additional calcium as well in those cases? The reason I focus on the thinking about the other puppies is because when you look at the outcomes of dystocia cases, in many, many cases, um, they ultimately go to cesarean. Um, and so, you know, only 30% of dystocia cases are corrected by manipulation medical treatment. So it's important always to have that in the back of your, your mind. Now, of course, adding to your problem sometimes may be that the pups are actually large. And this is a, a really nice example of a, an Anasaka puppy. So just to orientate you um, when it comes back into the field of view, I'll just start the video again. No, I won't. Here we go. So here's the heart. Here's the spine running here. And this is the skin. So the skin is lifted way up from the musculature. And this is all edema fluid underneath the skin. And you can see that on the puppy here. On the cross-sectional view, here's the spine of the puppy and here's the skin. Again, you can see all of this fluid. So this puppy, of course, identified as being an Anasaka puppy with ultrasound. It's a very good indication that we're going to have an obstructive dystocia. And then, of course, um, an uh, inability to deliver that pup. Here's a really nice example of uterine involution. So checking at the end of parturition that all of the puppies have been delivered. So we'll often see this very big bright area centrally in the uterus. <clears throat> and what you can see on the image over here is the two uterine horns. So just at, uh, at the uh, uterine bifurcation again of an involuting uterus. Sometimes, of course, the pup is retained and you may see remnants of the fetus. So you can see some of the fetal bones here in the uterus or here we've got a retained placenta. So you can see some outline of fluid and the central area where the where the placenta is retained. So they can be helpful. And of course, postpartum, we will often see um, a continuation of a discharge in dogs. And this is a really nice example of a dog with subinvolution of the placental sites. So the width of the uterus here is normal. The width of the uterus here is significantly increased. And that's associated with poor involution at that site. And as a result of that, then um, a continuation of bleeding. So just moving briefly on to the dog, we've got some uh, nice images of the, uh, uh, of the dog. So, of course, the testicle here, the head, body and the tail of the epididymis and obviously the vasculature, which I'll, uh, I'll come on into in a, in, in a moment. When we look at the testicle, um, there's a central white line running along the testicle, which is the mediastinum testis. Uh, the epididymis is situated just here. Here's the epididymis just scanned on its own. So we've got a homogenous appearance to the testicle. Um, when we look in front of the testicle, so here's the outline of the testicle here, and this is the pampiniform plexus. So we've got this, uh, uh, you know, lovely crisscrossing appearance and the blood supply uh, in the, uh, at the neck of the scrotum. Uh, we don't usually identify very well the body of the um, of the epididymis, but this is a dog that had a vasectomy, and you can see here's the outline of the testicle. Uh, this is the mediastinum testis, and here you can see that the epididymis is, dis is dilated because of the obstruction caused by the vasectomy. So it's just useful to, to see that. Um, there's a relationship between the size of the dog and the volume of the testes, not unsurprising, and there's also a relationship between that and sperm output. An ultrasound of the testes is really useful because it enables us to see both focal abnormalities and also it en enables us to see um, general ab uh, generalised abnormalities. So a really nice example of a focal lesion that you can see just here, 
and in this view just here. Here's the mediastinum testis, and here's, of course, the, out, the rest of the outline of the, uh, of the testicle. Uh, using the colour flow, you can see it's really lighting up this, uh, this lesion very, very nicely from the rest of the, te uh, of the testicle. So a really uh, useful technique for being able to identify structures. Uh, sometimes they're very large and of course you can palpate them clinically and sometimes they're small and you can't palpate them at all. So the ultrasound uh, is a very useful technique for, um, for us. So a variety of different appearances. So you can see this large tumour here has got limited central blood flow. It's hypoechoic compared to normal. This one is particularly cystic or multicystic as well. So uh, quite, quite a variety of different appearances. Now, one of the features that we'll often see in dogs with poor fertility is the kind of consequences of some insult to the testicle. And uh, that you can see here really quite nicely, these areas of fibrosis or calcification. So these often are called microlithiasis uh, when they're calcified areas. Sometimes we just see very small areas. There's been some insult to the testicle that has resulted in laying down of uh, fibrous tissue and then calcification. So these really bright echogenic structures very often associated with poor semen quality uh, in dogs. And then usually if the condition progresses associated with testicular degeneration. So in this testicle here, which is now small in size, you can see these levels of fibrosis and calcification uh, that, are, uh, that are laid down. Some insult has occurred several months previously. Here we've got a generalized change, a diffuse change. This dog has orchitis. So the background texture of the testicle is now very, very dark. It's edematous associated with the orchitis. And here we've got a lovely example of uh, the t appearance of the testicle and then all of this fluid material outside of the testicle. This is a dog that had a, a torsion of the spermatic cord and all of this fluid accumulation within the, uh, within the scrotum. We can use ultrasound as well to detect cryptorchid testes. So this is a small testes. It's still got the same normal appearance. We can still see the mediastinum testis. We can still see the epididymis. So present in the uh, in the abdomen. And we can also see changes associated with poor semen quality. So this patchy kind of marbled appearance uh, present in this testicle associated with um, a reduction in the number of normal sperm. We've done some similar things with uh, blood flow. So I've just moved that first image around so we can look at the blood flow in the neck of the scrotum. We can look at the blood flow where the tail of the epididymis is, and we can also look at blood flow within the uh, uh, within the body of the testes. So here we've got blood flow just in front of the testes. Here you can see blood flow running around the back of the testes within the epididymis, and then obviously these intratesticular vessels. So nice examples of uh, of testicular flow in a, in a normal ex in a normal animal here and you can see we've got the same type of pattern of flow that i described for you um, in the uh, in the uterine artery more diastolic flow actually um, and that's because we, we've got limited f uh, resistance to flow so after the systolic contraction there's not a lot of resistance so diastolic flow is actually relatively high in in each of those uh, different regions so you can see the same pattern across the different regions, the systolic peak and a lot of diastolic flow. And we've tracked uh, changes in, uh, in flow in dogs that are fertile and infertile, and we can see differences in blood flow associated with that. So presumably testicular pathology results in changes in uh, blood flow. And then one of the things we've been doing more recently has been using contrast enhanced ultrasound. So that's injecting uh, a, a solution of micro bubbles into the uh, arterial supply and tracking that with ultrasound as those micro bubbles move through uh, the, the, uh, the different organs. And I'll show you both testes and also um, the, uh, the prostate gland. So here's the outline of the normal testes with B mode ultrasound. And then this, this is the contrast study. So you you, you don't see much of the parenchyma and then you can see an increasing um, blood supply as the um, uh, as the micro bubbles start to perfuse through uh, through the testicle. 
So here's a, right, a really nice example. So on the B-mode ultrasound, we see this focal lesion here. And on the contrast enhanced ultrasound, we see it's actually got a really increased blood supply. So it's now highlighted by the microbubbles. So obviously the microbubbles containing air appear echogenic when we look at them. So when we move on to the prostate gland, um, the prostate gland obviously is bilobed. So uh, a really nice example here, you can see the left and right lobes. Here's the colon. Uh, ultrasound transducers in the middle, so it kind of looks like a, a butterfly or something like that. Uh, here's the um, the neck of the bladder, so this is a longitudinal scan and you can see the prostate gland uh, here. There are quite a lot of variations in the normal appearance of the prostate, and in fact, the the size of the prostate uh, varies quite a lot according to dogs. So there's not a really nice linear arrangement between relationship between the, the size of the dog and the width of the prostate gland. But we can easily identify it. We can identify it in castrated dogs, and of course that's important because dogs that are castrated also get uh, prostatic disease, prostatic tumours in uh, in particular. So the, the measurement of size of the gland is a, is a bit tricky in terms of looking for, uh, for pathology. So what do we do? Well, I think we have to use a combination of, of clinical assessments as well as our ultrasound assessment. So palpating the gland and feeling whether the gland is freely movable. Is the gland painful? Uh, is the gland smoothly marginated? Um, can we move the gland from one side of the uh, pelvis to the other? Is there sublumbar lymph node adenopathy? So can we see, can we see lymph node? enlargement. Um, so each of these things will add to our ability to image the ultrasound. The, um, the common things that we'll see with uh, prostate pathology, of course, is the commonest one is prostate hyperplasia, very often seen as this increased echogenicity, usually a symmetrical enlarged gland. And then, of course, commonly seeing the development of these little cystic structures scattered throughout the gland. It's a very typical appearance, these small cystic areas associated with um, accumulation of fluid, the gland overall increasing in size. Dogs with prostatitis will often have an edema of the gland. So we saw earlier on a dog with orchitis where we saw case, um, a decreased echogenicity of the testicle. And here we've got, uh, we've got prostatitis and you can see surrounding the prostate, there's a there's subcapsular edema. So there's a rim surrounding the prostate of increased blood supply and edema causing this pattern. So some nice changes that we can uh, that we can see there. Here's a good example of a dog with a prostatitis. So here we've got a big fluid filled cystic region containing pus present. Um, so a really good example of thick walled area of the prostate gland and some very obvious pathology um, to the prostate. And of course, one of the good things about ultrasound is it does enable us to target. So we could very easily, for example, put a needle in and do a fine needle aspiration um, of the prostate. So something that would be really helpful to determine what is the nature of this. Is this a paraprostatic cyst or is it an infected uh, prostate? So maybe a prostatic abscess. Here's a really good example of a cystic structure that's, um, that uh, isn't infected. So you can see it's a, a multi-septated structure in the caudal abdomen. So on the radiograph, you can see it's, uh, it looks like a big circular structure, but actually it's got multiple cysts present within it. And usually the fluid is black unless it's infected. And then, of course, the kind of final kind of pathology that we'll see is neoplasia. And just to remind you, of course, that for the students that are here today, um, castration doesn't uh, necessarily protect from neoplasia. So we will see cases of prostatic neoplasia in, in dogs that have been neutered. And what you can see in this, in this appearance of the prostate is, I guess, probably best described as disruption of the normal architecture. It doesn't look like a normal prostate anymore. It's got areas of increased echogenicity, casting shadows. It's got some areas of decreased echogenicity, some areas of fluid accumulation as well. So when you look at the prostate, so here we've got almost a, a fluid filled cystic region, these very bright central region, regions casting shadows and of course disrupted blood supply. One of the things that we can do uh, with our contrast um, enhancement to ultrasound is to do exactly that with the prostate gland. And this is uh, this is my last slide, um, just showing you the process of the enhancement of the prostate gland uh, following injection of the microbubbles. So what you uh, what you can see is the B mode image here, 
and on the right hand side you can see the contrast enhanced image. So the prostate gland first of all was not visible and then you could see the arterial supply here and here and also at the top and then gradually you see the increased opacification of the prostate. And this is one of the things that we're now using to uh, look in more detail at uh, prostate pathology. I'll just go back to the beginning. So here's the contrast study. We don't see very much. We've just injected the micro bubbles. And what you'll start to see in a moment as time progresses is the uh, a pacification here of the vascular supply, then the gland becoming much, much brighter. And then, of course, we'll move through this wash in phase to uh, the, the full perfusion of the prostate and then, of course, a wash out phase. So this is uh, we found this more recently to be quite useful for looking at differences between prostatic masses to try to determine whether or not they're neoplastic or whether they are benign. So what I uh, what I hope I've done is to give you a, an overview, uh, a very quick overview. Um, trying to do the things that I said at the beginning to show you some of the interesting uses of ultrasound that um, show the physiology and how the physiology is interesting and different in uh, in dogs and bitches to other species, um, to link it to some of the clinics and the things that you will see if your students, the things that you'll see in your future careers, and also to, to, to put in a little bit of the of the research that we've done that links to both of those different areas. So I think my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention, everybody. And uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me along today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Gary. It was uh, neat, illustrative and beautiful images, especially the updates on contrast enhanced imaging. We really enjoyed it very much. And there are of course, a very a few questions we have uh, sorted out. Um, what is the specific uh, findings in ultrasound in case of endometritis? Uh, that, yeah, that's a that's a, a really interesting question. So I think that um, in cases of um, so I would define endometritis in, in, uh, that you'll see in two different um, times. So I think sometimes it's associated with um, introduction of bacteria at the time of breeding. So in most cases, there will be endometrial disease. So you will see cystic structures in most of those cases, maybe a small number. But for me, the typical feature is fluid within the uterus. So I would say in the vast majority of species, you don't see free fluid in the uterus. If you've got free luminal fluid, it, it means that there's a that there's some pathology going on. So, you know, we see fluid, of course, when there's a pregnancy, but it's contained within the conceptus. So free fluid in the period after mating in diestrus, to me, would indicate a, a, light, a, a diagnosis of endometritis. Now, of course, postpartum in dogs, you may have the development of a metritis. And again, in a, in a metritis, I didn't uh, show any pictures of that, but postpartum, a metritis will again be associated with fluid in the uterus. And of course, in many cases, the bacteria that's present invades into the uterus and causes the, the dam to be sick. So usually there's, there's clinical illness in the dam as well. Those cases, if they don't completely cure, they can go yes, on to become a chronic endometritis as well, usually associated with fluid. Hello, sir. Hello. Is it on? Yeah, yeah. So how do you diagnose the fetal condition at field if there is a lack of ultrasound? Yeah, I, I think looking at um, uh, fetal pathology is quite difficult. Um, you know, so we've we've identified an, a number of dogs which have had um, anasarco high drops, like on the, I showed you one of the images of that. Um, some dogs with uh, hydrocephalus, um, some dogs with um, ventral herniation, so uh, where the abdominal wall is incomplete. Um, but the problem, of course, is that many of these um, abnormalities are easiest to detect in late pregnancy. 
Um, but in late pregnancy, it's difficult to see all of the fetuses. If they're, you know, if you've got five or six fetuses, it's very difficult without clipping all of the hair and spending a very, very long time. And what we tend to do, of course, is really to make a diagnosis of pregnancy early because the, the owner wants to know that their dog is pregnant and how many puppies there are. And we tend often to not to look later. So I think you're right, actually, it's an interesting area. There will be a lot of pathology and probably we just don't spend the time and don't look individually enough uh, to, to detect those cases. So I think you know pathologies have been detected and written up but there's probably many more things that we could identify if we were if we were to be more careful and look more more frequently. Thank you, sir. Do we get uh, um, can you detect uh, retained testicles and does uh, this is of course through ultrasound? Sorry, I got the you. It, it, it froze. So you said retain testicles, and did you say something else? So, yeah. What is the ultrasonic features of retained testicles? Okay. Uh, what? Yeah. What is the success in uh, identifying through ultrasound? Whether okay. resistant index is useful? Yeah. So the, the the they do have. So usually they are hypoechoic. The parenchyma of the testicle is darker than the normal testicle. Um, the, the testicle is small, of course, but it does have the central mediastinum testis. So the, the critical thing that you will identify is a, a spherical structure or an elongate structure, which is hypoechoic, but has that single linear line running through the middle, which is the mediastinum testis. So the way of uh, the way I look for them, of course, is just to start at the uh, at the caudal pole of the kidney, and I'll image on either side from the caudal pole of the kidney down to the inguinal canal, looking for something that looks like a testicle. But of course, um, say if, if anything is smaller and darker, but it's the mediastinum testis that's always still prominent that um, helps you uh, confidently say that you can uh, you, you you've got a, a retained testicle. Uh, can you say in your in your experience, uh, what is the percentage of identifying the retained testicles through ultrasound? Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, to be honest with you, I. I of the ones that I've done, I would say it's a high number. I don't think that there's many cases where there's been a, a testicle that I haven't found. Um, I, I mean, I guess I don't know the other way around. I don't know how many times um, in, I, I've made the diagnosis the wrong way around. But when there when there is a retained testicle, I've normally found it. Um, so I guess I could have said there isn't one. Um, and um, uh, 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 or, or I've mis made a mistake and said there is one when there isn't, but uh, I would say high, 90%, 95%. Thank you, thank you, sir. sir Neil. And thank you, uh, uh, Professor Gary, for your, the uh, acceptance for the presentation, and uh, the students had a, a good uh, uh, announcement or update on this subject. Thank you very much. May I call upon uh, Thank you. Dr. Rangaswamy for proposing word of thanks. Good evening to one and all. On behalf of organizing committee, Professor C.H. Arthur, Community Oration 2021, Global Veterinary Reproductive Webinar, I, I, I express gratitude and thankfulness to our like, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dan Was, Professor T. Palachitran Sir, for giving permission and support for conducting this webinar in a successful manner. I feel privileged to express wholehearted thanks to our beloved Director of Clinics, Dan Was, Professor C. Palachitran Sir, for his encouragement, creative suggestion, and the constant support for in conducting this webinar in a great successful manner. We express thanks and gratefulness to Professor Gray C. W. England, Dean, School of Veterinary Medicine and Designs, University of Nottingham, United Kingdom, for readily accepting this invitation and the delivery of outstanding lecture on small animal reproductive ultrasound and manipulative delivery in dogs. I thank Mr. Karnadi, Vice President Alambic, and Dr. Sandosh Sinde, AGM Alambic, for technical support for this webinar in a successful manner.
I thank our Dean, Madras Veterinary College Chennai, for providing conference call on necessary facilities for successful conducting of this webinar. I thank Professor and Head Animal Department of Animal Husbandry, uh, Animal Statistics, and the Professor and Head Department of Extension for deputing faculties and staff for this webinar. I thank all the faculties of the organizing committee for help and constant support. Finally, I thank all the participants who are actually involved in participating in this webinar. Thank you, one and all. Yeah, thank you, Professor Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Sir, in 